listening to Sustainability Now, a radio show focused on environment, sustainability, and social justice in the Monterey Bay region, California, and the world. I'm at Whiskey Hill Farm, which operates in conjunction with Bloom Distillation on Calabasas Road, just north of Watsonville. Dave Bloom, the di director and CEO, and I will be doing a walking interview and tour of the farm, talking about its permaculture and regenerative agricultural practices, as well as technological innovations connecting alcohol distillation and organic agriculture. Whiskey Hill Farm is a 14-acre organic farm uh, on the site of a former cut flower nursery. The farm employs polycropping permaculture techniques in six large greenhouses to create food forests of multi-layered polyculture. Dave is CEO and Director of Research and Development at Bloom Distillation and Whiskey Hill Farm. He's the author of the critically acclaimed book, Alcohol Can Be a Gas, and he has been engaged in one sort of farming or another for more than 40 years. What are you trying to do here at Whiskey Hill Farm in, in you know, broad sense? Well, I think we're trying to demonstrate uh, what people kind of in vague uh, generalities call regenerative agriculture. Now, back in the 70s, I started using that word uh, to distinguish between what I was doing and so-called sustainable agriculture. So what does sustainable mean? Well, you can often hear the argument, well, so that seven, seven generations from now, the people then have the same level of uh, inputs and access to raw materials as we have today. And I thought about that and I talked with a Native American elder in the Blackfoot tribe about it. I said, it doesn't, doesn't feel right to me. It feels like there's something missing there. He goes, the details. <laughs> well, he said, it's a good idea, but when are you gonna fix all the stuff you broke first? So sustainable means don't wreck it any more than it is now. Mm -hmm. And regenerative means we need to improve and return to fertility the lands we've damaged so yeah, it's not good yeah. enough to just stop wrecking we yeah. need to build you know uh, uh, back the fertility of the planet and so that's what I've been doing my whole life so but, but this was a cut flower farm before you took it over and, it was and what my question is what was the status of the soil or the condition of the soil when you arrived they used um, gosh, fungicides and herbicides and pesticides and miticides and rodenticides and every side you can think of, okay? So the soil was completely sterile when I moved mm. in here. Mm. It, it, I would have an easier time growing food on Mars than I did inside these greenhouses. And I have designed growing food on yeah. Mars. Tom NASA's mentioned that. that, that, that that's your... But uh, <laughs> so what we had to do is we had to do some radical soil building and we started a major compost operation here intercepting waste plant matter from all over the county and uh, building compost to inoculate the soil and I concocted uh, a 40, 40 species uh, solution of bacteria and fungi which I inoculated the soil with mm -hmm. and these the combination of the organic matter which is what the organisms feed on, and those organisms made it into a living soil again. And now we have, um, as you will see inside, some pretty amazing results from the soil that's only a few years old. Now, it just proves that we are clever monkeys and we can repair what we've damaged. Okay. One of the first things you're gonna notice walking in here is we have some rather tall corn. Yeah, I'd say it's, it's a giraffe uh, level rather than elephant level. Uh, yes, it's about 16 to 17, 16 or 17 feet tall. And it's at the end of its life. Um, we did this without any fertilizer. None. Okay. Because the years of building up organic matter and, uh, and of course, all the organisms that eat the organic matter and then poop out what they've eaten, even though they're bacteria and stuff, that's the fertilizer, you know? And of course, earthworms eat up the organic matter and leave fertilizer. So we didn't add any fertilizer to grow this crop, but we actually grew several other crops prior to this crop and crops with this one. So we first planted this 
this broadleaf plant here, which is called turmeric, and it's at the end of its life now. It's drawing down all of its juices down into the roots, which is, you know, how the plant re reproduces, just like, say, potatoes or um, ginger, etc. All the juices go into the roots, and so all this beautiful growth that they had and all the oils, all the oils here that were in the veins are going down into the root. But before we planted that, there were a few other things we planted. We quick planted a crop of lettuce because it took about a month for this to sprout. So we immediately seeded lettuce. We got a crop of lettuce. And we then, as soon as, as we were taking the lettuce out, we were transplanting in basil because the little shoots of this plant were just coming up. And then a crop of basil came up, we harvested that, and then we planted the corn and beans. So this is not just a, a polyculture, in other words, growing more than one thing, but it's also a relay cropping system. In other words, one thing follows the next in a system. Now, polyculture isn't practiced by um, modern, um, agriculture because it it requires digital harvesting and by that I mean 10 digits okay if you have multiple crops growing there isn't a piece of machinery in the world that can go in and dig the ginger dig the turmeric harvest the corn it can't be all done by machines machines can be pretty smart but um, handling so many different crops in the same row no it can't be done so the thing is, machine agriculture makes sense if you're looking for five cent a pound corn, so that you can make 50 cent a pound cows. But, uh, but when it comes to making food for people, polyculture wins every time. In, um, you know, locally here in Santa Cruz, Steve Gleason did a, a very good study on the corn, bean, and squash uh, polyculture which is practiced all over Latin America. And what he looked at, how many grams of food on a dry weight basis were produced by that combination of crops, it was quite a bit more than a pure corn, scientifically managed, chemically farmed field in the Midwest. So what he proved is using, you know, almost Stone Age, agricultural knowledge, we were able to get two or three times as much food per acre as we do with the best science nowadays. The difference is removing a labor from the calculation. So by able to being able to use big machines, we now can eliminate people from the growing of the two major crops in the United States, which are corn and soybeans, which are almost exclusively used for feeding animals. Right, right. Um, so out of corn, you know, basically 90% goes for animal feed. Right. Perhaps 3% um, goes for things like modified food starch. Uh, a little bit goes into dog food. 1% uh, goes into things people eat. In other words, breakfast cereal um, and corn chips, mm -hmm. right? And then, so I wouldn't really consider those food. Those are kind of industrial, you know, cardboard oh, projects, yeah, you know. Yeah. And then there is 1% of corn that does go for something I think is really valuable for people, and that's called whiskey. So that I do consider food. And, uh, and so out of all that corn, very little of it becomes anything people use unless you count uh, eating meat. So who do you have then harvesting the crops here? I mean, who does it? Well, we typically have six people here that harvest the crops and we grow a diversity of crops. So we hopefully don't have everything come at the same time. Right. And that way we can keep up with it. So right now we're about to start harvesting these dried corn stalks uh -huh. and we're going to sell those for uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas decoration. Oh, and uh -huh. my gosh, we made four or five times as much on, on that as we do on the corn itself. Now, I don't have any right here. But the other way we make corn into something that's higher value is we, uh, is, I mean, here's the a beginning ear of corn, and we inject these ears of corn. Let's see, this one doesn't have what I'm looking for. We inject these ears of corn when they're growing with a fungus, and it's called um, corn smut, 
and it's in Mexico when your corn has this fungus, it's considered uh, your corn has been kissed by God because what comes out of the out of the ear of corn are these pillow shaped funguses, which are worth three or four times as much as the ear of corn. So by culturing, see, it's another polyculture. We're very adding good, in a fungus good. now, and it's it concentrates and makes more soluble the protein that's in the grain that would be in the grain and makes uh, things like vitamin B12, which are not in the corn. So it balances a critical nutrient without meat mm -hmm. in kids and that kind of thing who are very sensitive to shortage of B12. So people who have, you know, lived with corn, beans and squash, they go, well, how, you know, they're vegetarians. How do they get their precious nutrients that only meat can provide? Well, the answer is fungus, you know? And so a little bit mm -hmm. of fungus goes a long way. Sure. So the reason I grew corn here wasn't so much that I wanted to eat corn, although I wanted to sell the wheat lacoche or corn fungus I made with the, uh, with the corn, but the corn provides filtered shade. It's just like a thin, a thin canopy of a forest. Hmm. This big leaved plant, whenever you see big leaves like this, they're getting hammered with lots of sun. And if you look at where they would grow in nature, they grow at the edge of the forest. In other words, uh -huh. they're adapted to limited oh, sunlight. Yeah. So, so by, you know, I could either buy shade cloth, which would be the normal commercial mm -hmm. farmer's viewpoint, mm -hmm. but why should I buy shade cloth when I can grow my shade and eat my shade instead of buying some uh, petroleum-based product to create shade? Mm -hmm. You know, so... Uh, and of course, there's, as I told you, there were many other relay crops in the process, but this was the whole season shade strategy here. Who, who um, so who do you sell the, the products to, the, the food to? Oh, food uh, all the health food stores buy my turmeric. It's one of the most popular uh, products right now uh -huh. uh, in the health food market. And of course, ginger, we all use and everything. Um, there's also beans that, there's some remnants of beans that were grown earlier in the season. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. um, you know, and, and over here we have a selection of other uh, crops that we're growing. So, uh, you know, the idea is that we sell it to local stores, we sell it to national brokers, like mm -hmm. the turmeric goes all over the country. Uh -huh. uh, you know, last, oh, I guess it was three months ago, we sent 2,000 pounds of turmeric to the Whole Foods in Maryland across the country, mm -hmm. right? And you think, oh, that's a lot of energy, but the only place they would get it otherwise is from India, which is a lot more energy. So growing it here makes mm -hmm. it local, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, comparatively local, you know, yeah. only 3,000 miles instead yeah. of 11,000 yeah. miles. Yeah. Um, I well, like to think that growing stuff in the soil where you live is, is a less tangible, but an important aspect of nutrition of a crop. I mean, in theory, though, you could do the same thing in Maryland, right? And if you, if you, not all, maybe not all year, but. Well, you I make mean, a good point, but how, I got, I came to the conclusion to grow turmeric in a different way. When I first bought this property, I walked in here and I said, well, let's see, what surpluses does this property provide for me? And I'm looking at all this glass and I'm wiping the sweat off my brow and I go, oh, the surplus is heat. So what can I do to use the heat that this site provides for me? So I go, well, that's tropical. Right. So uh, I started growing tropical crops knowing that I have an advantage over those who have to airship them from another country. Right. So I, you know, I take advantage of what I have, which is the extra heat. And so that's why I started growing this crop and it turned out to be exactly the right choice because yes. uh, it doesn't grow really anywhere in America other than maybe, well, in Hawaii, which is tropical, and a little bit at the south of, uh, south of um, Florida. But those would be outside, right? Those not would be outside. Not yeah. yeah, but uh, here I am, here you right are. here. Yeah. So, okay, so what should we go look at next? Well, let's have a little fun. Let's go into the tropical rainforest. Okay. On our way to the tropical forest, uh, just here's a little garden here. Now, 
you know, we have a little bit of farm equipment, so this only took about eight hours to um, prepare the soil and plant um, plant all this food. So we got, you know, the kind of stuff we all like to eat. You know, this is uh, arugula. You're going to have to slip that under your mask, Ronnie. So this is a nice spicy winter vegetable. Cilantro, which my workers use in everything. They're mostly from Mexico. Here you'll notice mutt, onions, and carrots. They both repel each other's pests. Onions uh, repel carrot, uh, carrot thrips and, um, and carrots repel something on onions. But the other thing about them, I mean, planning and designing how you farm is that onions roots go this way and carrot roots go that way. So they use different parts of the horizons in the soil so I can pack more of them into the same space because it's not all the same plant. So that's an advantage of polyculture where you can pick different vegetables that take different soil horizons and so there is no competition for nutrients. Hmm. Okay, so we're going to walk into this uh, forest here, which is uh, far more pleasing than walking into a soil, a, a, a field of soybeans. But we have many things here. This is a tamarillo, sometimes called tree tomato. Uh, these are, I believe, yes, these are giant golden berries. And this is a papaya. Uh, and here are some bigger papayas here. Um, so let's go take a walk through, and I'll identify a few things, but I, what I want you to realize is everything you see as you're, fo as you're following me is a fruiting plant, an edible fruiting plant. So you can see some fruits of flowers and fruits forming here. What is this? this I believe this is, I don't know which one. <laughs> Let me explain that. I'm not an expert in tropical agriculture per se. I don't know all the species in here. I know some of them. But this whole thing is a volunteer effort by Santa Cruz tropical fruit uh, aficionados. Hmm. And they were all trying to grow these in little greenhouses in their backyards scattered all over. And we offered the space here to the group to bring their um, bring their babies in and mm -hmm. plant them where we could keep it warm. Mm -hmm. And so they've been working here for weeks now, planting all these different uh, different crops. Mm -hmm. And within a year, they'll all be producing fruit. Now, like this one is a very popular herb right now. This one's called ashwagandha. It's an herb from India. Um, the leaves are used uh, and the roots are used to make kind of a calming, sedative, blood pressure reducing medication, hmm. you know. Um, it goes on and on in terms of the things that are medicinal here. This is a mango. This is a dwarf mango here. So you can see there's one forming right there, mm -hmm. a little baby mango. Mm -hmm. So that'll be covered with mangoes this year. Uh, again, this is another papaya and by the end of this uh, upcoming year, this will be covered with papaya. Um, you know, you can see as we wander through all the different canopies, the different levels of light that uh, the different plants experience. Some have really broad leaves that shade what's underneath, and then other things underneath that make use of that shade. Um, Anyway, you get a sense of it here. There's coffee in here. There's many of the things that we think are valuable, but uh, but the idea is that all of this is fruiting food, and this is an enormous amount of food that will be here starting in about a year when the plants get more established. This is only about six months old. Most of the plants came in here a foot tall. So when they got to the, the climate that they really liked, they've gone crazy. Uh, the answer is seasonally we are. Uh, the turmeric is quite profitable mm -hmm. and 
We'd be wildly profitable. Mm -hmm. uh, in this greenhouse, uh, we have about 40,000 square feet. In this greenhouse, we can grow about 50,000 pounds of turmeric. Now, 50,000 pounds of turmeric times $7 a pound is $350,000. Compare that to an acre of corn, which makes maybe you know, a thousand or two thousand dollars at most, and we're making three hundred fifty thousand. We're absolutely profitable on turmeric and on some other crops. I'll show you, but um, that's not all we do here. Right. And the no. profit from the turmeric goes to fund our science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what we're standing next to here is a 750 gallon um, methane digester. And so what it is, it's a big bag full of water. And on top of it are sandbags that are attached to the top. The sandbags press down on the bag. And the reason why that's important is this bag is a fermentation tank. We put in my kitchen scraps for my kitchen the bacteria that are in this bag eat the, the plant matter and they breathe out uh, methane, which is, of course, a flammable gas. Methane is also known as natural gas. And so this little unit here could actually make about three hours of cooking from one day's worth of scraps from your kitchen. Now, behind this thing is a much bigger bag, which we made out of a pot liner. And it makes a lot more gas, which we use in our, our distillery, which you'll see in a little while. But I want to show you how it works, so I'm going to bleed off the air first. Oops. Let's bleed some of the air out of the line. And wait for the gas to... How long does it take to... to so it ferments in a day, basically. In a day or two, yeah. yeah. You know, the small... This, this kind of setup, where things even more primitive than this, are used in India in hundreds of thousands of homes and villages to take all the sewage from the house mm -hmm. in buckets and all the vegetable scraps and animal manure, and it makes natural gas for everybody in the town. There it is. So now we've got a flame. It's very clean, so it's hard to see it much, but we'll listen for it. It'll make us boil in a minute. So this is, this is made in Israel? It is made in Israel. People have made all kinds of methane digesters, though nowhere near as elegant as this. Now the, the vegetable scraps just go right in here. Yeah. So we just put in the vegetable scraps and push them down in under the liquid. And they make the gas. Now when you keep putting more stuff in, well, something's got to go out. So from this pipe here, um, the leftover methane digested material um, goes into this marsh and uh, there, there it is fertilizer for the marsh plants. Now these have all been cut down because it's winter and they're all going to start growing back. You'll see some green shoots. This is a, 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 a cattail marsh. So the idea of a cattail marsh is there's multiple uses for this. From, from our alcohol plant, the liquid waste after we make the alcohol it goes into this methane digester where it makes gas, which, which powers the alcohol plant. But then the liquid from that goes into, after it's been made into methane, goes into here. And there's a bit of an odor, but that's only because the plants have died down for a few months and they're going to come back. And the plants absorb all the nutrients out of the water. Now, one of the reasons that when you when you release sewage into a uh, river or whatever is that uh, that smell you smell is from anaerobic digestion. So the, the uh, sewage uses up the oxygen and then causes organisms to grow there and not, uh, that don't smell very good. But the other thing is, the big problem with sewage is nitrates. Um, and nitrates actually cause algae to grow in rivers or in bay 
case, and then that causes other ecological problems. So EPA regulates the release of nitrates. So for instance, hog farms, they have enormous problems getting rid of their nitrate-ridden nitrate swine manure. So what happens in a marsh like this is the cattails grow maybe to eight or nine feet tall. You can start to see them growing now. You know, here they are. Here they are coming up right here. See from the places where we cut them off. So um, as they grow, they absorb the nitrates. And then if, if we put in the sewage at this end, by the time it gets to the other end of this marsh. We've dropped the level of nitrates from 3,000 milligrams per liter to five milligrams per liter. So you're looking at legal to discharge water at the other end of this, because as long as you're under 10, you meet the EPA's guidelines for release of sewage into rivers. So the primary sewage uh, treatment comes from anaerobic digestion. And then the secondary sewage treatment comes biologically once again from these plants. Now, there's more, all right? So as these plants grow and absorb the nitrates, they also deal with the other big pollutant, which is phosphorus. So phosphorus is at a very high level. By the time it gets to the other end of the marsh, the plant does such a good job of absorbing phosphorus, it's only one part per billion at the other end. Phosphorus is another thing that makes algae grow out of control. But notice, in the cattails, we now have the nitrates and phosphorus. Now, I'm not going to waste all that. There's going to be a point at which I want to use those things. So now I've captured it out of the water. I've increased order. Instead of the disorder being dissolved in water, I've now collected and organized it. Cattails also do other unique things they'll go ahead and take mercury out of water and evaporate it into the air. It's a very interesting complex process it uses. Now, that doesn't destroy the mercury or get it completely out of the environment, but it takes it from where it's concentrated and diffuses it, you know, so that it's not concentrated in this poisonous in one spot. Now, once I've got the cattails growing, well, I can go ahead and harvest them. And cattails have a horizontal root, it's not a root really, it's a stem called a rhizome. These rhizomes are full of starch. So per acre, we'll get uh, the alcohol made from this starch will be 7,500 gallons. Is that a lot? Well, uh, you know, that's per acre, I'm sorry, 7,500 gallons per acre. Corn only gives you 300 gallons per acre. So it's 20 times more yield per square foot than corn. Now, the uh, you can tell there's there's uh, I there's uh, starts in the middle. You see that dark spot there? That was where I put a drop of iodine on the end of the stalk and uh, the rhizome, and it turns the starch purple. So we can, you know, prove to ourselves that there is starch in there mm -hmm. by seeing the purple. So. <clears throat> what we can do, though, is go a bit further. So we've got 7,500 gallons of alcohol we're making from the waste of the alcohol plant being absorbed and, you know, made harmless by this marsh. Now, the next thing we can do is take the protein out of the leaves. The leaves are where much of the nitrates end up and the phosphorus and become a lot of protein just prior to when it goes to seed because those compounds are always the best stuff that a plant puts into its seeds. Now cattails, these are cattail seeds here. They're all very, very tiny. And what cattails do to distribute themselves is they're wind distributed. So each one of those little seeds up there will blow in the wind. And when it falls on a wet spot, it goes ahead and roots and makes cattails. But the protein is in, mostly in there, but it's also in the leaves, which are now dried up here. If we want to get the protein out, which is a good idea, we can take the leaves and grind them up, and then we add alcohol. Remember alcohol, what we make back in the distillery? So we add alcohol to it and, and stir it, and at some point the protein migrates out into the fluid and then drops to the bottom as pellets. 
So we can then um, scoop those out and we can use that for animal food or human food. And we get 15 tons per acre of protein. Is that a lot? Well, corn only gives you two tons of protein per acre. So seven times as much protein. And of course you're cleaning up the water at the same time, but there's more. <laughs> okay, so these leaves are pretty much pure cellulose now and a little lignin. So we can grind these up until we have a fluff like this. And then if we put this through a briquette machine, they get compacted into a wood pellet, which can then be used for fuel. So in New Zealand, this is the system we're gonna to use to clean up the dairy runoff from 12,000 acres, 12 million acres of dairy land where the runoff from cow poop and manure uh, poop and uh, urine is polluting all the rivers and the ocean on the North Island of, of uh, New Zealand. But the dairies are powered by coal. So these made into briquettes can replace the coal and make the whole process completely uh, you know, uh, regenerative. This is how you do regeneration. You look at all the resources you have, you figure out how surpluses and repair the land at the same time. A little bit of an interesting uh, uh, thing to look at above us, and it was invented by a scientist at UC, Ber uh, UC Santa Cruz. And you'll see that there's solar panels that are red. Now, they're red for a reason, and as we all know, there are three primary colors. There's yellow, blue, and red. And all the other colors are made from those three colors. I so thought, I thought red came before blue. That's how I it think could be. They're okay. primary. The three are I'll, primary. I'll let you colors. go on this one. Oh well, thank you. <laughs> so if you look over in the distance at those passion fruit there, you'll see they're a nice dark green. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you, those of you who haven't thought about this much, why is that green? I mean, is they are somehow, you know, intrinsically green, but that doesn't explain why you can see the green. You see the green because that plant is reflecting yellow and blue. So the yellow and blue we see as green. That uh, Those two wavelengths together look like they're green. So the plant isn't green at all. The plant is reflecting green away from itself. So what it likes are reds and purples and stuff like that, just like these panels. So these panels are designed to let the light through that plants want and then take everything the plant doesn't want and send it out through our uh, electrical connection to the grid. So we're using uh, sunlight to go ahead and uh, partially power the grid and still provide the light spectrum needed by the plants. It turns out when you limit the amount of stress inducing uh, colors, you end up with 30% more yield. So, you know, here's a high tech interesting thing that works. Now, how, where would you find this kind of thing in nature? You find it, and you'll find it a little further on in this greenhouse. I'm going to see those as we go this way. Um, what is this? There's a pond here with uh, covered with the algae. That's right. It's covered with duckweed and algae. Duckweed is a floating plant, and algae, of course, is a uh, a plant that lives in the whole water column. Mm -hmm. So, so this is covered with the, the nutrients at the end that come out at the end of that pond go into this pond. The algae uses up the remaining nutrients to grow, and at the same time gathers solar energy because, like any plant, they're photosynthesizing. So, what's photosynthesis? It's carbon dioxide and water. So carbon dioxide is carbon, water is hydrate, and then solar energy glues that together and makes sugars. Sugars can be made into many things. So the carbohydrates are about 50% in this algae. So it's mostly starch. You can make bread out of this algae in Native American spirit. Um, but it's also a high percentage of protein. So we, 
we can get all that stuff for ourselves and do something with it. But there's another thing that happens here because when plants take in carbon dioxide and they keep the carbon to make carbohydrates, what do they let go of? Oxygen. Plants are the opposite of us. We breathe in, in, in oxygen, out CO2. They breathe in CO2 to breathe out oxygen. If it wasn't for plants, we'd all be dead. So here's a bunch of oxygen, a surplus of oxygen, a surplus of food. Gosh, what should I do with this algae? Well, I pump it over into this pond, which is loaded with catfish and uh, crayfish. And so in here, you'll see it's very different color because most of the duckweed has been eaten by the fish. So, uh, you know, there's parts of the world where they say, you know, a, a farm without a fish pond is not a farm, okay? Because it's the recycling center at the end of the chain. So let's just quick review. The alcohol plant made alcohol. The liquid from that went into the methane digester. It made gas, it made fertilizer, soluble fertilizer, that went into cattails. That went down to that end, growing all the cattails normally, and then into this pond where the remaining nutrients feed all this algae and oxygenate the water. And now we put it in here for the fish to have something to breathe and something to eat. And obviously these aren't meat-eating fish, they're vegetarian fish. So, um, Fish actually are, are quite a bit better uh, animals for heat feeding people than cows are. Because cows, well, takes 10 pounds of corn in rough numbers to make one pound of cow. But that also means they make nine pounds or more of manure, right? In other words, a lot of waste goes into the production of meat. When you feed this animal food, this algae and stuff to the fish, it only takes a pound and a half of algae and that kind of thing to make a pound of fish. So it's much better than the 10 to one of cows. And that's why they call fish what they call them because they're efficient. So, but no. so anyway, our next step is to be growing crayfish in here. Now, when I say crayfish, the other term for them is freshwater lobster. They get about this big. And they don't grow in the ocean like normal lobsters. They grow in an algae pond like this, and they eat the um, bacteria and the fish poop. Remember, we're trying to get one more thing out of the system. That small amount of feed that was wasted as fish poop is eaten by the crayfish. So the crayfish are ready to harvest in three months. They're a very fast crop. Uh, and the taste of freshwater um, lobster is uh, considered superior to that in the ocean and it comes without mercury in the ocean being filter feeders the the lobsters become impregnated with mercury which makes them very unsafe to eat so this is a much better product and uh, we have constant um, inquiries from asia to sell this to them you know by air freight but we're going to sell it just to local restaurants when they reopen now you, think I, you would think I'm done, but there's one more level. Inside the freshwater lobsters is this special, super soluble, highly charged calcium, and they call that structure in the gastrolith. It's about pea-sized. Why is it there? Because lobsters have exoskeletons. If they get a, a, a bump or a crack in the exoskeleton, they can get infected and die very fast. So this gastrolith is like, uh, I don't know, epoxy to a crack. It goes right to the broken part and builds new shell really fast so that the lobster doesn't get infected. Well, this form of calcium isn't found anywhere else in nature, just in these shellfish. So sports doctors are taking these gastroliths, grinding them up to powder, put them in a little water and inject them into uh, athletes that break a bone and in days the bone heals and they can go back to playing football for the corporation so they pay a thousand dollars a gram for gastroliths 
So by the time you start looking at all the profit, first we get the natural gas, then we get the cattails that produce 7,500 gallons worth of alcohol, 15 tons of protein and wood fuel. And then we get all this algae with oxygen. We feed it to the fish, we get fish, we get fish poop, and then we get crayfish, which are worth money. And of course we wouldn't sell them live. We'd cut them open, take out the gas of it, then sell them pre-cleaned. And there was one more product. That whole chain, there's one more product. We take this water and we irrigate our fields with it. And all the nutrients that have made their way down the chain of conversions to this point now feed our crops. If we fed alcohol producing crops, we'd have a closed circuit, right? We'd have the crops going back to the distillery to make more alcohol. But I'm not a big fan of the closed loop. That's a survivalist concept, you know? We really need regional, you know, regional energy flows and self-sufficiency, not individual farm closed loop. That's, that's you know, that's for, for the survivalists that want to, you know, uh, continue on after the end of the world where they need to close their loop. We want to be interdependent, not independent. We want to be able to trade our crayfish to um, somebody who has something we want. We want to sell our fertilizer like we do from the alcohol plant um, to other farms to go ahead and uh, fertilize their farms with our surplus, we call it a waste product. And so, you know, when you do that, you get back from them in different ways. You know, we needed to have a piece of equipment taken off a truck. We didn't have a big enough forklift, but one of the guys that we get fertilizer to brought his big forklift over and lifted that 12,000 thing, dollar, dollar thing off the truck. Those kind of interactions count just as much as the pedestrian interactions of what we can sell. So it's important to realize that you don't, you don't produce just products, you also produce services when you have a farm. Now, let's go a little further. This pipe here, stainless steel pipe, galvanized pipe actually, um, receives the hot water from the plant. You'll remember we showed you a 4,000 gallon tank full of hot water. So the hot water goes into this pipe, and if you come down this way, you'll see that we have these blue tubes that come down from the pipe. So they go four feet underground, they go all the way to the other side of the greenhouse and come back up into another pot. You can see them down there. So the thing with this is, this hot water goes down the tube, it heats the soil four feet down, doesn't release any water, it's just like a radiant heat tube in your warm floor. And so the soil gets warm. Now, <clears throat> why is this important? If you take a look at a greenhouse, and this one's been covered by dust from plowing next door, so we're waiting for the rain to clean it off. But if I'm growing a crop in here, and I have to keep it warm so it doesn't freeze on those nights, that former farmer used to use $1,000 a night worth of natural gas to keep his greenhouses warm. So to keep the plants warm, they used to have to heat the glass, the steel, the air just to heat the plants. Mm -hmm. Well, if I just put my hot tubes under the soil and the soil's nice and wet and the, the soil moisture gets up to 60 or 70 degrees, then the plants sending their roots down there can pull up 70 degree water and internally heat themselves. And it could be 20 degrees out, outside. They go, we don't care. We're plenty warm inside. So. I would use less than 10% of the energy of the former farmer used to heat the whole environment just to heat the tissues of the plants when I let the plants do it for themselves by just storing the heat underground for them. You know, you never told us where the, what heats the water. Well, there's many different ways to heat the water. Most of it comes from waste heat or surplus heat from the alcohol plant. Yeah. But for instance, in the summer, the temperature at the top of the greenhouse will be 120 degrees. We can blow that air out, went into the greenhouse through a heat exchanger and heat the water to almost that temperature and uh -huh. put it in the tank or use it 
we use it right away. There's many places to find heat. I remember you showed us uh, water heating in the compost piles. Yes, that's the other way to do it. It's a large amount of heat. We usually have a compost pile on the other side of this wall, which we're just now starting to build, and we put plastic tubing in it. We run water through the tubing with a pump, and um, that hot water, the water comes from the tank, the big tank we saw, we pump it through the pile, it goes up to 120 degrees and we put it back in the tank. Mm. So the heat of composting, biological heat, right? It's not, it's not based on a fuel, it's biology reproducing, giving off so-called body heat. That heat gets up to 120 and we can harvest it. And when we do it, we keep the pile cool enough so the bacteria and funguses can keep reproducing because if it gets too hot, it kills them. And so we take the surplus heat and we store it in our tank and we can send it wherever we want on the farm. And where does the water go after it's, it's gone? It, it circulates it's back. It's just, it's, it's, it's it just circulates back. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There's a pipe down here further all the way down that comes back over here to the compost pile. Uh -huh. So let's go this way. I'll show you a couple more things. We're, uh, we're walking through another football field size greenhouse, part of it dedicated to the cars. And we're now uh, underneath some kind of cover. All right, so this is this is a canopy vining plant. Now, you're going to see this one here. It's called Chayote. And you'll see it all over, out about 15, 20 feet. And around the corner, it goes around 15, 20 feet. That's all from one plant. It's a jungle plant in Latin America. It grows all through the trees, okay? And uh, for some people, this is their basic vegetable in the rainforest. And it's plenty of starch, a lot of calories, and nutrients. But uh, further in, if you look further in, you'll see that most of these are passion fruit. And let's see, here's one. There are little animal tracks in the beds there here. Are. What, what is that? You know? Coyotes. Coyotes. Oh, coyotes. Yeah, we have coyotes in here because we have rabbits. So we leave the doors open at night. The coyotes come in here and eat the rabbits, you know? And they sing. <laughs> yes, they do, don't they? Okay, so this is passion fruit. Take a taste of that, Ronnie. Just the pulp inside and the seeds. Just go ahead and chew on. And then what's this other Chayote. 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 Now let me hand this one along. Let me just suck out some of that right there. Isn't that amazing? So, so remember I talked about having a light shade? Well, mm -hmm. this is a little more than a light shade, okay? Yep. I, I planted too many, so I have to thin them out for the next year. But uh, this crop will provide filtered shade when it's less dense. And that means all the crops underneath will do a lot better because partial shade increases, uh, increases output. But <clears throat> these fruits are worth a dollar a piece. A dollar a piece and looking at thousands of fruits going down in this one bay. So, um, you know, gosh, everyone thinks farming has to be really hard, really backbreaking work. But next year, we're going to put the trellis right up against the glass, and these will grow up along the glass. And then underneath, we're going to put fishing net, with small holes, down to the sides. And these things are ripe when they fall off the bush. So they'll fall off, they'll fall under the net, they'll roll down the net into a bucket, and this is a self-harvesting plant, okay? But, the, you know, we can get, when, this is only one year's growth. This is a very willing plant. So when we get it established next year, up there to its permanent location on trellises at high, it will probably start putting out about... Uh, seven tons per acre. So, eh, not so so many tons. I mean, other things put out more tons, but that's 14,000 pounds. And there's about eight 
passion fruit per pound. So that's going to be $92,000. And I haven't even planted anything in the soil yet. So $92,000 sure beats buying shade cloth. You know, $92,000 in income. So then underneath, we plant the, tr the plants that like shade, like turmeric, etc. So we're using all the sunlight. We're not wasting most of it, which is what happens with most crops. our miniature distilling room uh, you know it, it takes care of making our alcohol for after aftermarket uh, products like extracts from plants and sanitizer and even fuel to replace gasoline so the process starts off when we put molasses and hot water in those fermented tanks over there A, B, and C and once we have the right level of sugar in there with the molasses and the water, we add yeast. The yeast eat the sugar, they breathe out CO2, which goes out through those gray pipes you see at the top. And uh, otherwise they make the alcohol. So after three days, we're up to 10 to 15% alcohol, depending on how much molasses we put in. And uh, the yeast have finished their three-day party. So then we go ahead and after they're dead drunk, we go ahead and start pumping the liquid from there into the distiller. So it comes first into this distillery column, and this one evaporates the alcohol multiple times until at the top it's about 50% alcohol and 50% water, or 100 proof. Then from there, it goes outside to another column, which takes it up to 192 proof, and then we use another step to make it 200 proof. And then we have further steps to make a pharmaceutical grade, getting rid of the 800 other chemicals that yeast make when they ferment. So once we've done all that, we now have a high quality product to sell for sanitizer, for making drugs, etc.